On the night of August 18, 2000, in New South Wales, Australia, a 48-year-old man was resting in his bed, oblivious to the danger that lurked nearby. Unlike any other night, a sinister figure slipped through his bedroom window, bent on one dreadful mission, murder. This case study delves into the chain of events that not only led to this brutal killing, but also the incidents that preceded and followed it. The murder of Jack Van Crevel was just one heinous act in a series of horrifying deeds. As we delve into this case, we extend our heartfelt condolences to all the victims who had an unfortunate encounter with the Van Crevel family. The setting of this tale is East Albury, New South Wales, Australia, an inconspicuous rural town almost lost in obscurity, with a population of approximately 6,500 residents. It's a closely knit community where everyone is familiar with each other. This modest town was home to the Van Crevel, Valera family, which included Belinda Van Crevel, who was 20 years of age at the time of her father's murder, and her brother, Mark Valera. We must also mention Mark's close friend, Keith Schreiber, as all of these individuals play substantial roles in this chilling narrative. The siblings had been brought up by their father in Wollongong, located south of Sydney after their mother left when Belinda and Mark were merely two and three years old. Their childhood under their father's care was far from ideal. Jack Van Crevel was a harsh, abusive man who rarely exhibited any parental qualities. This harsh upbringing bred a deep-seated resentment and animosity within the children towards their father, a feeling that only intensified as they grew older. It is undeniable that a child's upbringing profoundly influences their character, future potential, and the manner in which they lead their adult lives. The significance of a sound upbringing has perhaps never been as strikingly evident as in this particular instance. This case is not centered around a single crime, but rather a series of heinous acts, each contributing to a chilling saga of malevolence. The initial crime that brought the case into light transpired on June 12, 1998, in Wollongong. David O'Hearn, a 63-year-old local shopkeeper, uncharacteristically failed to report to work one day. Concerned, his family proceeded to his residence in Albion Park, only to be met with a horrifying sight that would forever scar them. Mr. O'Hearn's lifeless body lay sprawled across the living room. His limbs splayed out in an eerie stillness. A gruesome sight met the onlookers. His head had been horrifically severed from his torso. Even more unnerving, his severed hands had been used as guides to trace their shapes onto the walls. All his internal organs were missing, contributing to an incredibly disturbing crime scene. This was no ordinary homicide. The police were certain of that. His severed hands were positioned on the arms of a chair, suggesting the presence of an unseen entity. During the horrific act, his internal organs had been neatly arranged on a silver tray adjacent to his corpse. Detective Inspector Peter Woods remarked in all my years of service in the police force, I've never encountered a scene quite like this. This brutal and bizarre series of events sets the backdrop for the intricacies of this case. The deceased's body had been brutally disfigured to such a degree that it thwarted the pathologist's efforts to pinpoint a definitive cause of death. Speculations arose that a shattered decanter found in proximity to the body had been the instrument of death for Mr. O'Hearn. However, considering the level of his suffering, it is a mystery what eventually led to his demise. His decapitated head was later discovered in a kitchen sink and chillingly used as a canvas against the living room walls, where a pentagram and an inverted crucifix were drawn. The incisions on his wrist, neck, and chest bore an unnerving precision. These grim findings led the police to surmise that this was a ritualistic killing, possibly linked to a satanic cult. Nonetheless, this was not the sole murder to occur in the area during this period. A fortnight later, on June 26, another body was found. The victim was identified as Frank Arkell, an ex-Lord Mayor of Wollong and a former member of the New South Wales State Parliament. The modus operandi bore striking similarities to David O'Hearn's case. Mr. Arkell's skull had been brutally beaten with a bedside lamp, and an electrical cord had been used to asphyxiate him. 
Like Mr. O'Hearn, injuries inflicted after death were evident, albeit without the gruesome disembowelment seen in Mr. O'Hearn's case. In this instance, the murderer had made precise cuts around the chest, leaving the organs intact, and pins were inserted into the victim's eyes and cheeks. Despite the shared satanic overtones in both crimes, the victims were markedly different. Mr. O'Hearn was a respected family man and business owner with no apparent enemies. In stark contrast, Mr. Arkel, despite his former public office roles, was under investigation for child pornography and pedophilia. He had been acquitted, yet authorities remained convinced of his guilt and continued their investigations. While vigilantism is never condoned, his alleged heinous crimes made him a potential target. Following neighborhood inquiries, the police soon acquired a lead. Living mere houses away from David O'Harn were Mark Valera and his close friend Keith Schraber. Neighbors recounted witnessing unusual activities at their residence, suggesting the duo might be involved in satanic cult rituals. However, police had to verify these allegations, leading them to visit the two men. Upon entry into the young men's home, the police were immediately confronted with peculiar drawings scattered around the house and on their personal belongings. These drawings featuring unsettling symbols and crucifixes bore an eerie resemblance to those found at both murder scenes. Law enforcement quickly suspected Keith and Mark's involvement in the killings, but substantial evidence was lacking. Despite the gruesome crime scenes, the murderer appeared to have carefully avoided leaving any traceable evidence. However, the police eventually stumbled upon something valuable. Although the O'Hearn crime scene was devoid of significant evidence, fingerprints were found but remained unmatched. It was only after a thorough examination of the scene and surrounding areas of Frank Arkell's murder that a breakthrough came. A pair of blood-stained trousers and boots were discovered. DNA and fingerprints retrieved from these items successfully matched to Mark Valera. Valera's former girlfriend corroborated this evidence, sharing with the police his peculiar beliefs and confirming his ownership of similar boots and trousers. Keith Schreiber was briefly brought into the investigation, but was quickly ruled out due to a solid alibi. An arrest warrant for Valera was hastily prepared. As the police were about to depart the station to execute the arrest, an unexpected turn of events occurred. Valera walked into the Wollongong police station and confessed to the crimes. Upon questioning, he revealed his motives for targeting the two men. Valera said, I think Mr. O'Hearn was a homosexual. He propositioned me a while ago. Killing him was pretty random though. My dad had abused me as a child and to see another older guy coming on to me. A 19 year old, it seemed wrong and reminded me of my dad. Frank R. Cole was a very, very, very horrible man. He tried to come on to me once as well, but I told him to go away. I'm not sorry for killing him. He was a dangerous pedophile. In July 2000, Mark Valera stood trial for murder charges, astonishingly pleading not guilty and instead claiming manslaughter. His defense team argued that his control had been compromised due to his tumultuous upbringing and the abuse he suffered from his father. This argument, although keenly presented, was unequivocally dismissed by the judge and jury. The court handed down two life sentences to Valera, making him the youngest individual in Australian history to be detained in Supermax, a facility reserved for the most dangerous and severe offenders. His prison records bore the unflinching declaration, never to be released. Police had long harbored suspicions that Valera was implicated in a third murder, that of Trevor Parkin. Parkin met a grisly end in 1997, when he was killed with a bowling ball and subsequently dismembered. Despite these suspicions, the authorities were unable to establish any concrete connections between O'Hearn, Arkell, Parkin, and Valera, resulting in the investigation being discontinued. However, the police's suspicions persisted until a male sex worker, Christopher Robinson, was eventually charged with the crime. Despite this, law enforcement maintained their belief that Valera was somehow involved. Belinda Van Crevel's life had been perpetually mired in violence. Raised 
albeit in the loosest sense of the word, by a man who consistently subjected her to physical abuse. She witnessed similar treatment meted out to her brother. Living in constant fear, she saw her brother, now a self-confessed Satanist and double murderer, as her only beacon of hope in a tumultuous life. It was inevitable that such a volatile environment would make it challenging for her to lead a normal law, abiding life. It is entirely understandable that both siblings harbored intense resentment towards their father. How could they not harbor negative feelings towards someone who had exposed them to relentless abuse throughout their childhood? Belinda's admiration for her brother was profound. She considered him the sole positive influence in her life irrespective of the heinous crimes he had committed. However, during Mark's trial, a revelation caused a shift in Belinda's perspective that was irreversible. While she was aware of the physical abuse, Mark's accusations of sexual abuse by their father caught her off guard. This revelation was seared into her memory, a haunting reminder that she would never be able to erase. Fast, forwarding several years into the storyline, Mark was deeply entrenched in serving his double life sentence. On the outside, Belinda had initiated a relationship with Mark's closest friend, Keith Schreiber. She remained in her father's residence out of necessity, having nowhere else to relocate, and had recently embraced motherhood herself. Despite her circumstantial shift, her simmering resentment and hatred for her father remained undiminished, brewing within her like a dormant volcano on the brink of eruption. Belinda's feelings towards Keith were ambiguous. It was unclear if her affection was genuine or if he was merely a pawn in her game. Being an attractive young woman, she wielded undeniable power and influence over men, especially Keith Schreiber. She exploited their time together to relentlessly remind Keith of her father's mistreatment towards her and his best friend, Mark. She asserted time and again that her father was the reason behind Mark's incarceration and deserved a dose of his own medicine. When she believed that her words had sufficiently affected Keith, she planned her move. On August 18, 2000, it was time to act. In the wee morning hours, Keith Schreiber made his way to Jack Van Krebel's home. As he slowly ascended the stony driveway, axe in hand, he stealthily entered through an open window. His intention was to kill Jack in his sleep, but the plan went awry. Jack Van Crevel woke up and retaliated, resulting in a violent skirmish. Despite his age, the 48-year-old Jack attempted to defend himself against the relentless ax swings by Schreiber, eventually gaining the upper hand. Mr. Van Crevel endured 25 individual ax blows, and an additional 16 stab wounds inflicted by a knife Keith had brought along. In case it wasn't evident, Belinda had facilitated Keith's entry by leaving the window open. She had also conveniently placed the ax outside the property for him to collect before entering. Belinda and her four-year-old daughter were present in the house during the murder. In the adjoining bedroom, they bore witness to the attack as Jack Van Crevel's screams and pleas for mercy resonated through the house. Following the incident, Belinda revealed that her terrified daughter had inquired, what's happening to Poppy? Belinda, rather than fleeing the scene, chose to shield her daughter's ears and patiently wait for the killing to be over. The police quickly identified their prime suspect, given the intricate relationships between Belinda, Lara, and Schreiber. Keith was apprehended within a day, not making any significant effort to conceal his deeds. Following a short-lived denial, he decided to reveal his actions to the police in full detail. He justified his act by labeling Jack a pedophile who deserved his end, claiming that he had performed a public service by eliminating him, thus preventing further child molestation. However, the police force, competent and shrewd, did not buy Keith Schreiber's self-proclaimed vigilant narrative. Keith, a man with no prior inclination towards such violent behavior, was not deemed capable of independently deciding to murder Jack Van Crevel. The convoluted dynamics of the Van Crevel family were not lost on the investigators. Although Keith remained silent on whether he was manipulated or persuaded by someone else into committing the crime, the police had their suspicions. After Keith's confession, Belinda was next to face interrogation. 
Throughout her questioning, she attempted to maintain an image of innocence. And did you never go on out of the skate No, I never even thought about it. <laughs> Have you ever had any relationships with him? Yeah, sexual wise or any nature like that? I, I won't answer that. I don't think that's got anything to do with this. It's actually got a lot to do with it because it's investigating the murder of your father. Yeah, but what's sex got to do with someone being murdered? We're murder. just trying to. While she vehemently denied directly imploring Keith to execute her father, she did confess her desire for him to be dead. This, in itself, does not provide sufficient grounds to accuse her of explicit involvement in the murder. However, her seeming indifference to Keith's predicament raised eyebrows. Having fulfilled his role in her scheme, Keith was left to face his punishment alone. Keith Schreiber was handed a 16-year sentence for his crime with a stipulation that he must serve at least 12 years before being considered for parole. Belinda Van Krebel, on the other hand, did not escape without consequences. She received a six-year sentence for her role in the solicitation of murder. In 2007, Belinda emerged from prison with a commitment to a new lease on life, having spent her entire existence engulfed in the storm of violence, even being an instigator on occasion. The question loomed, could she truly make such a drastic change? As time passed, Belinda seemed to prove her resolve, keeping herself out of trouble. She even found love shortly after her release. Marshall Gould, a carpet salesman, crossed paths with Belinda in a rug store in 2008. Their connection was swift and profound, leading to a child together. Initially, Belinda refrained from revealing her turbulent past to Marshall likely out of fear that it might dissuade him. However, one day, she confronted him with a book titled Bound by Blood. Here's an engaging tale of true crime, all taken from her family's history. With a cheery, read this and ask me anything that's on your mind. She offered the story up. Certainly, the average person might be startled to discover such a colorful past in their partner's family. But as for Marshall Gould, he didn't bat an eyelid. He said, I wasn't too concerned about it. I had a few questions, obviously, but it didn't put me off her. She had only ever been very caring towards me and helped me through a messy divorce. I could only judge her on what I had seen. Marshall was on the verge of gaining profound insight into Belinda Van Krevel's psyche. On a day that appeared ordinary, Belinda unexpectedly lashed out at her partner in a fit of anger. Marshall narrated how her eyes seemed to lose all color and took on a disturbingly dark hue. Following a series of attacks against him, she darted into the kitchen and swiftly returned, brandishing a knife. She said to him, I'm going to fucking kill you, Jack. I'm going to fucking kill you. In a surprising turn of events, Belinda assaulted Marshall, inflicting six stab wounds across his arms, leg, and neck. Despite being left on the ground, significantly weakened from severe blood loss and his life precariously teetering on the edge, Marshall refrained from contacting emergency services. In his words, I didn't want her charged. He contacted his father, Wayne, requesting immediate assistance. Without hesitation, his father promptly transported him to the nearest medical facility. Unfortunately, due to the circumstances, Mr. Gould's preferences were no longer in play. The emergency services personnel are obligated to report any episodes of violence to law enforcement, a responsibility they fulfilled diligently in this instance. Despite the unfolding situation, Mr. Gould remained unwavering in his efforts to protect Belinda. He asserted to the police that his injuries were the result of an assault by three unidentified men, rather than implicating her. He said, I didn't want Belinda to get in trouble. I just wanted us to be able to work through our issues on our own. In the end, the police managed to coax a confession out of Mr. Gould. He revealed everything about the incident while also insisting that Belinda, despite her actions, was truly a good soul who hadn't intended any harm. Curiously, Belinda was absent from the hospital where her partner was. The following morning, as Wayne Gould sat vigil by his son's bedside, he received a call from Belinda. Neither the police nor the law seemed to buy into the stories Marshall or Van Crevel spun about the events that transpired. 
Van Krebel was promptly charged with assault with deadly intent and received a three-year sentence, with parole possible only after serving at least two years. Marshall's dedication to Belinda was profound, to say the least. He visited her in prison regularly and even wrote a detailed letter to the judge, presiding over her case, outlining her past and pleading for mercy. This might be why she received a relatively lenient sentence. Yet, despite Marshall's undeniable and somewhat perplexing devotion to Belinda, their relationship was doomed to fail and ended before her release from prison. Upon regaining her freedom, Belinda seemed to have simmered down and attempted to start anew. She stayed out of trouble for a few years, seemingly grasping her opportunity for a new beginning. That was until June 2020, one fateful night. Van Crevel and a friend celebrated the arrest of Belinda's new partner, who had allegedly been abusing her. Alcohol and drugs fueled a fight between the two women over a joint that supposedly wasn't being equally shared. Belinda emerged victorious, choking Smith with a grip that seemed unbreakable. Although she did eventually let go, she proceeded to repeatedly punch Smith before onlookers intervened and broke up the fight. But Belinda wasn't finished. She flung various ornaments, including ceramic statues and glass candle holders, at Smith, one of which struck her squarely in the face. Despite facing two additional assault charges, Van Crevel was granted bail while awaiting trial. Her lawyer argued she'd acted in self-defense. On January 6, 2022, Belinda, now 41, continued to display her volatile temper and unpredictable violent outbursts. She was first charged with stealing a handbag in a coffee shop, a charge she denied on the grounds that the bag had been left unattended. This renewed series of criminal activities could be traced back to a significant revelation that she had been previously unaware of. As we've noted, Belinda was fiercely loyal to her brother. She's expressed on numerous occasions her wish to serve his life sentences on his behalf, stating that he wasn't resilient enough to withstand prison life. However, a few years ago, Belinda saw a hit list that her brother had written in the A2Z of serial killers. Book pages during a television interview. As she flipped open the book, a cryptic question stared back at her from the inside left cover. Who will be my number three? Underneath this eerie query, a lengthy list of names laid out Mark Valera's future targets. Her gaze gradually traversed down the page until it landed on her name, etched in bold uppercase letters. Belinda tried to suppress her alarm, feigning indifference over her name's inclusion, but her concern was betrayed by the subtle shift in her expression and the slight squint of her eyes captured on video. Regardless of her past or current state, one thing remained unchallenged her unwavering loyalty to her brother. The heartache from this unexpected betrayal was palpable. After all, Mark had been a steady figure throughout her life. They had navigated their tumultuous childhood together, often seeking solace in each other after enduring their father's physical abuse. Belinda had always considered their bond indestructible, but Mark's hit list abruptly shattered this belief, leaving her feeling isolated and without a confidant. Despite her troubled past, Belinda Van Crevel remains a free woman today. After a confrontation with a supposed friend, she was handed yet another lenient punishment. On November 29, 2022, she was mandated to complete 80 hours of community service. Consequently, she continues to move freely among law, abiding citizens, seemingly still capable of unpredictable violence. Belinda Van Crevel, often referred to as Belinda Van Ebel in Australia, has achieved notoriety for being dubbed the country's most wicked woman. Her extensive rap sheet and lack of remorse for her crimes raise questions about her trustworthiness. It's evident that her troubled upbringing and her brother's influence have shaped the path she has chosen. Each time she engages in criminal behavior, it seems to be triggered by a reminder of her painful past. While this doesn't excuse her actions, it highlights the extent of her emotional damage which could hinder her from leading a law, abiding life. Law enforcement faces a dilemma. Should they incarcerate her indefinitely or pursue rehabilitation? At present, the criminal justice system seems to favor rehabilitation, 
striving to aid Belinda instead of confining her for a significant duration. However, two major issues persist. First, Belinda displayed her audacity when sentenced for stabbing Marshall Gould, claiming she could withstand the sentence effortlessly. Her lack of fear of prison is alarming. Second, by keeping her out of prison, the justice system risks endangering the public. Belinda's track record proves she's capable of violent acts when provoked. It's hard to imagine she wouldn't reoffend, posing a constant, significant threat to society. Since her community service order, Belinda has managed to keep out of trouble. However, this pattern of temporary law-abiding behavior followed by criminal activity has been a recurring theme in her life. We can only hope she has truly changed, but can we ever be certain her volatile anger isn't simmering beneath the surface, ready to explode once more? We dedicate this to all the victims of Mark and Belinda Van Crevel. David O'Hearn and Frank Arkell both perished as innocent men. Even though Frank Arkell was under suspicion, we can't prejudge the outcome of any investigation. Jack Van Crevel, while no saint and certainly not a model father, met a gruesome end due to his daughter's manipulation of Keith Schreiber. Keith, after serving 12 years of his sentence, has since stayed out of trouble and has severed ties with his past. Marshall Gould, another victim of Belinda's volatile rage, thankfully survived and is now leading a life far removed from Belinda Van Crevel. We also acknowledge Belinda's children. Her daughter, fortunately, was removed from her care at a young age and adopted by a loving family where she continues to be cherished. Her son lives with his father, Mr. Gould, who is raising him single, handedly. Understandably, Belinda has no visitation rights and the child is undoubtedly safer with his father. We hope that all the victims who can still share their stories manage to move past their encounters with the Van Crevels and lead fulfilling lives.